Hi, everybody. So welcome to uh, another uh, reading of uh, a little bit of fan fiction that I have written. Some DC Comics fan fiction, just like uh, the last time I uh, read you a, a story that I wrote uh, that was sort of like my own version of what happened after Dick Grayson punched out Bruce Wayne, Robin punched out Batman and sort of left to, you know, uh, strike out on his own. And this story that I am going to read tonight takes place right after that. Uh, so this is sort of like the next episode, if you were, of uh, of that particular uh, series. So I, I tried to come up with a better title for, for the story that I'm about to read you than the title that it still has on the document. But for now, you know what? To hell with it. We're just going to call it what I called it as I was writing it. And the title is Dick Does Metropolis. Because if you remember... Uh, at, at near the end of that story, the last one I read, the the the, the Dick and Bab story, um, Dick mentions that as a part of his sort of soul searching type of thing, he might go to uh, to Metropolis to visit Superman. So that's where we picked the story up. And I just want to thank everybody for being here and for listening and for watching. I hope you like the story. Uh, this is just fan fiction. It's just for fun. I'm not making any money off of this, uh, and no copyright infringement on actual licensed uh, official canonical DC comics properties is intended. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that, you know, once you actually hear me read the story, you'll see that there really is no competition because the story I'm going to read is a lot better than what they're doing right now. So anyway, um, let's, <laughs> let's get started um, with Dick does Metropolis. And I timed the read earlier today and it, it'll probably take me about an hour and 15 minutes to get through it. So settle in for an hour and 15 minutes of uh, Superman and Dick Grayson story time. Here we go. <clears throat> As Superman flew toward the origin point of the silent alarm that had reached his ears a second ago, he pondered how little certain things had changed in the years since the world discovered who he was and what he could do. He was often asked to attend parades or special sessions of legislative assemblies, and invariably one of the VIPs would, in the course of their speech, marvel at what a difference he had made. It was all very nice. The gratitude of others never failed to humble him, to reinforce the value of what he did, of the good he was able to accomplish. But on the other hand, thanks to his X-ray vision, he could already see the crew of bank robbers fanned out strategically in the lobby of the First Metropolis Bank and Trust on Levine Street, three of them holding guns on the frightened customers and subdued security guards who lay flat, face down on the floor, the other two in the vault with two bank employees urging them at gunpoint to keep stuffing sacks of cash into black canvas bags. Superman imagined it was how many bank robberies committed before his time must have looked, how much of an impact could he really have had if the crooks he regularly turned up to thwart still hadn't bothered to modify their standard tactics? And why hadn't they, he wondered. Were most bank robbers just that lacking in imagination? Were there only so many ways of robbing a bank, none of them well suited to evading capture by an invulnerable, super strong flying person? And if that was the case, why not just rob banks somewhere other than Metropolis? It would at least improve the odds. An instant after he finished that thought, his red boots hit the sidewalk just outside the front entrance. The police had not arrived yet, though he could hear the sirens approaching still several blocks away. He pushed the door open and strolled into the bank as though he were any other customer. Several customers noticed him right away, but he lifted his finger to his lips confidentially. The nearest member of the crew was standing a few feet away with his back to the door. Superman reached around from behind and plucked the pistol the man was holding right from his hands. Confused and alarmed, the robber spun around on his heel and found himself facing directly into the red and yellow emblem on Superman's chest. He drew back his fist, but when the punch came, Superman leaned out of the way, grabbed the robber's arm, and placed his other hand on the robber's shoulder. No, no, Superman said gently as he forced him to the ground. Hands behind your head, he said when the robber was on his knees. The robber complied. Good, said Superman. He crushed the man's pistol in his hand and dropped it, mangled, next to him on the floor. Don't move. By now, the rest of the crew had noticed his presence. The other two in the lobby raised their guns at him and squeezed off a flurry of rapid-fire shots. 
Not wanting to endanger anyone else in the bank with ricochets, Superman reached out and casually caught each bullet in his hand as it flew near him, crossing the lobby toward them as he did. He reached the next one, disarmed him, and forced him to the ground, much as he did the first one, then turned over his shoulder toward the third one, who was still firing. When he knew the robber had fired his last round, Superman directed a short blast of heat vision at the robber's pistol, superheating the gun and forcing him to drop it to the floor. An instant later, Superman was next to him, and that made three bank robbers disarmed and on their knees. The other two emerged from the vault, each one with a bank employee in front of them. Superman had just enough time to notice the curious fact that none of them seemed to be carrying any sacks of money before one of them fired his pistol at the ceiling. Soups, you know what's good for you, and for them, you'll step aside and let us walk out of here. We both know that's not going to happen, said Superman, extending a hand cautiously in front of him. Let them go, put down the guns, and this will all end peacefully. That's the best way this is going to go. The robber who'd fired the gun smirked, then turned to his partner. Nail him, he said. The other robber raised her weapon, a pistol, but not like any Superman had ever seen. She squeezed the trigger, and a beam of blue light shot out of a crystal embedded in the muzzle. Superman dodged to the side, and the beam struck a table behind him. In an instant, the table was reduced in size to only a few inches high. Superman turned back to the robber with the... what else was he going to call it? Shrinking gun. That's interesting, he said under his breath. In a blur of motion, Superman moved from where he was standing to just behind the robber with the shrinking gun. He took it from her, x-rayed her pockets, and found another, more conventional pistol, which he took, then pried free the hostage she was holding and forced her smoothly to the ground. Then he turned and did the same thing to the last robber standing. X-raying his pockets, Superman noticed something that made him shake his head and grin with reluctant admiration. When all five bank robbers were disarmed, them kneeling with their hands behind their heads, the bank's security guards back up and keeping a close eye on them, Superman picked up the shrinking gun. He heard the first police cars arrive outside and started for the door. As he stepped outside, he passed the shrinking gun to the first officer he encountered, whose name tag identified him as Flickman. Superman? said the confused patrolman, examining the strange gadget he'd just been handed. Superman nodded toward the bank. You've got five robbers, all disarmed, all waiting to go peacefully, he said as he bent his knees and prepared to take off. What's this? asked Flickman, holding up the shrinking gun. Check their pockets, Superman said as he lifted into the air. A few seconds later, he had risen out of sight. Flickman shrugged and walked into the bank. There were the five robbers on their knees, hands clasped behind their heads, as Superman said, Hey, Duffy! said Flickman to one of his fellow patrolmen as he walked past, pulling a set of handcuffs from his belt. Be sure to check their pockets. Think Superman missed something? Duffy asked sarcastically as he pulled one of the robbers to his feet, the last one Superman had subdued. Duffy patted him down, squinting suspiciously as his hand felt something in the robber's pocket. Duffy reached in and removed a tiny canvas bag, smaller than a coin purse. He opened it, and inside found hundreds of tiny slips of paper, all printed to look like $100 bills. What the hell is this? Duffy asked. His eyes went from the tiny money in his hand to the gun Flickman was holding, and then back to the tiny money. Flickman blinked at the gun, then turned to Duffy. Better call Henderson, he said. Clark straightened his tie as he stepped off the elevator into the newsroom of the Daily Planet. Within seconds, Lois was at his side, stuffing her phone into the messenger bag slung over her shoulder. Where have you been? she asked. Lunch ran late, said Clark, adjusting his glasses. Well, said Lois, I know you aren't looking forward to it any more than I am, but we're due at City Hall in half an hour to interview the mayor's deputy director in charge of energy efficiency about the special investigator's report alleging widespread embezzlement from the Renewable Resources Fund that was published last week, and good lord, I'm putting myself to sleep even describing it. Let's go. She took a step toward the elevator. Clark held up his hand. Hold on a second, he said. We might be off the hook for this one. He started toward the editor-in-chief's office on the far side of the room. 
Mr. White, Clark said, knocking on the door as he opened it. Perry White was at his desk, glaring at the screen of his computer, brow furrowed, hand to his forehead. Kent, he said, looking up, where the hell have you been? Sorry, said Clark. I uh, went to that deli that always gets my order wrong. Which one is that? Said Lois, elbowing, on, elbowing him on her way past the office. Gandolfo's? Clark stared at her for a beat, saying nothing, then turned back to Perry. On my way back in, I heard on a police scanner that Superman just nabbed a bank robbery, just stopped a bank robbery over on Levine. So, said Perry, cocking an eyebrow, Superman stops half a dozen bank robberies a week. You're going to need more than that if you want to get out of interviewing the deputy director. These bank robbers had a shrink ray, Clark said, waving his hand as though placing that particular detail on Perry's desk. Perry thought for a second. All right. Fine, get on it, he said, waving them toward the door. Clark was two steps out of the office when Perry called him back in. Kent, one more thing. There's a kid here to see you. It says he knows you. He's waiting at your desk. Clark nodded. Thanks, Mr. White. The kid at his desk was leaning against the back of Clark's chair, chatting with Lois as Clark approached. Clark recognized him immediately and extended his hand with a smile. Dick, he said brightly. Good to see you. What brings you to this neck of the woods? Passing through on my way to New York, Dick said with a shrug. He gestured at Lois. Thought I might as well try to get Miss Lane's autograph as long as I'm here. Lois folded her arms and lifted an eyebrow at Clark. So he's a friend of yours, she asked, indicating Dick with a nod. More like a pal, Dick said, digging his hands into his pockets and smiling with obviously feigned modesty. Jimmy Olsen appeared at Clark's side as though summoned by an incantation. CK, Miss Lane, the chief says you're working the shrink ray bank robbery? Looks that way, said Clark. Shrink ray robbery? Dick asked, cocking his head to the side. This afternoon, Superman stopped a bank robbery where the crooks used some kind of a device to reduce the size of the money they were stealing, said Clark. They could have walked out of there with millions in their pockets and no one would have been able to tell. Where does a gang of bank robbers get a shrink ray? Dick wondered out loud. That's what we're going to find out, said Lois. Jimmy reached his hand out to Dick. Jimmy Olsen, he said. I don't believe we've met. Dick Grayson, he said, shaking his hand. If you're here for the intern program, they're starting orientation on the third floor conference room in about 10 minutes, Jimmy said, pointing his thumb over his shoulder toward the elevator. Oh, no, said Dick. I'm not an intern. He turned to Clark. But I am transferring to the Pennington School in New York this fall, and they have a really prestigious journalism program. I was thinking about looking into it, but I'm not sure journalism is for me. He turned back to Jimmy. So I figured I'd drop in on my buddy Clark here and pick his brain. Like a ride-along, Jimmy said with a nod. The thing is, technically, it needs to be approved by Mr. White if any non-employee accompanies Planet staff on an assignment. But if you want, I can go put in a good word for you. Oh, that's really nice of you. Thanks, said Dick. He stared at Jimmy for a beat. You going to go do that now or? Jimmy's eyes narrowed. He opened his mouth to say something, but before he could, Lois slapped him on the arm with the back of her hand. Go, she said. And don't forget that camera. As Jimmy trotted away, she called after him to add, bring a macro lens. Lois pulled her messenger bag around and dug out her wallet. I am starving. I'm going to go grab a sandwich out of one of the vending machines. Clark furrowed his brow. You just got back from lunch. I spent my lunch on the phone fighting with one of the mayor's press secretaries to let us conduct an interview I didn't even want to do, Lois said. Next time, I'll go to your deli, since apparently waiting around while someone tries and fails to make the right sandwich is the best way to land a scoop around here. Remember that for your journalism program, she said, pointing at Dick as she started away. We'll meet you downstairs, Clark said. He slid his hands in his pockets and turned to Dick. So, what's really up? It's a long story, Dick said. If you need a place to crash, my couch is always available. Thanks, Dick said, but I really am on my way to New York. I'll be fine, but think we can talk about it later? I'll make time, but it might not be for a while, depending on how this shrink ray thing shakes out. You mean, said Dick, a grin tugging at the corner of his mouth, depending on how long it takes you to size up the situation. Clark lowered his head. I rescind the couch offer, he said as he turned and started toward the elevator. Jimmy, he called across the newsroom as he walked. Are you coming? 
Jimmy jogged over from his desk, looking annoyed. The chief says I can't go. I have to lead orientation for the interns in the photography department. We'll try our best to muddle through without you, Clark said with a sympathetic grin. Dick pulled his phone out of his pocket. I can always snap a few pics, should the opportunity arise, he said with a wink. The last thing he saw as the elevator doors closed was Jimmy Olsen's icy glare. They were the only two on the elevator. After a few silent seconds, Clark inclined his head toward Dick and said, Were you flirting with him? Dick wrinkled his brow. Was I? I thought I was kind of a jerk-ass. Is Jimmy into wanton jerk-assery? Clark shrugged. I don't know, but it's not unheard of, he said. Some people obviously are. Your partner never seems to have trouble finding a date. The billions of dollars helps with that, said Dick. Clark nodded thoughtfully. He took a beat. There was a wink. Winks aren't necessarily flirty, said Dick. Sometimes they're just cheeky. You can start off at cheeky and find yourself at flirty before you even know you've gone anywhere. Dick chuckled. <laughs> I'll be sure to remember that. Did something happen with you and Bruce? I punched him, said Dick, as the elevator dinged and the doors slid open. Interesting. I definitely want to hear about that later, Clark said, stepping off the elevator. Lois stomped her foot down onto the brake pedal and leaned into the horn as the car in front of her stopped short at the yellow light. Come on, you had plenty of time, she yelled loud enough that her voice went a little ragged at its loudest. We don't have all... Some of us have places to be. So the Pennington School, Clark said casually over his shoulder to Dick, who was sitting in the back seat. What made you decide to transfer there? It's in New York, Dick said matter-of-factly, and I have family there. I thought you didn't have any family, Lois said, raising an eyebrow at Dick in the rearview mirror. That's why you're living with Bruce Wayne. Lois looked to her right and noticed Clark glaring at her through narrowed eyes. If you're comfortable talking about it, that is, she added, turning, to, turning back to Dick's reflection before shooting Clark an annoyed sideways glance. It's okay, I don't mind, said Dick. I didn't think I had family there either, but it turns out I do, and I'd like to spend some time with them, I guess. They must be some family if you're willing to give up Wayne Manor for them, said Lois, who immediately blared her horn again when the car in front of her failed to move into the intersection two seconds after the light went green. I swear to God, she said as she eased down the accelerator. I don't know how those bank robbers could help themselves from using that shrink ray on traffic. If I had one of those things, the streets would be littered with matchbox cars. Clark folded his arms and smiled as he breathed a sigh. We could have taken the train, you know. He said, Why would I take the train when I have a car? Lois asked, furrowing her brow. So, Clark said, turning back to Dick, how long have you been interested in journalism? I don't know, he said. To be honest, I'm not totally sure I'm interested in it right now. I've just been thinking a lot about, I don't know, what I'm going to do with my life. Whatever it winds up being, I want it to count for something. A smile spread over Clark's face. Well, journalism certainly counts for something, he said. Wouldn't you say, Lois? Lois grunted. <laughs> yeah, we really make a difference, she said dryly. If you want journalism experience, she said, glancing at Dick in the mirror, why not get that guardian of yours to buy you a newspaper? Clark shook his head. Lois. What? she asked. It's an option, right? Like in Citizen Kane? Didn't somebody buy him a newspaper? Clark blinked at her. You've never seen that movie. Never even wanted to, she shot back with a grin. Dick lowered his head and chuckled. <laughs> Bruce owning a newspaper, he muttered to himself. The way things are going, he could write it off as a charitable contribution, Lois said. She clicked on her blinker and turned right into a parking garage. A little bit of a walk from here, but it beats circling the block for an hour, trying to find a spot on the street. I'm sure Dick won't mind walking, said Clark. I sure won't, Clark, said Dick. A grin pulled at the corner of his mouth. Will you? Clark glared over at Dick. Clark, Clark glared at Dick over his shoulder, suppressing a grin of his own. Not a bit, he said. So, Dick asked a few minutes later as they rounded a corner and headed for the bright glass building just down the block. We're going to Star Labs. Why? Because of the shrink ray, said Lois. Shrinking technology was used by Brainiac, added Clark. 
determining whether or not the shrinking gun used by those bank robbers this morning is Brainiac Tech is a good place to start with the story. So we're going to consult with Earth's foremost expert on Kryptonian technology. They reached the front entrance of the Star Labs building. Clark held the door open for Lois, then waved Dick through as well. Makes sense, said Dick as he stepped through the door. They found Dr. Emil Hamilton in his lab, arms folded, staring through a window that looked into a testing chamber. An alarm above the door let out a beep as they entered, and he turned at the sound of it. Ah, Miss Lane, Mr. Kent, he said. Hamilton's gaze settled on Dick. And I don't believe we've met, he looked to Lois. The new Jimmy Olsen, I take it? Lois chuckled. <laughs> Jimmy sure seemed to think so, she said under her breath. Dr. Hamilton, this is a friend of mine, Dick Grayson, Clark said, putting a hand on Dick's shoulder. He's shadowing Lois and me while he decides if he wants to be a journalist. Hamilton nodded in Dick's direction, then turned immediately to Clark. So, which do you want first? The bad news or the potentially even worse news? Clark turned to Lois. What do you think? From the way he phrased it, understanding the even worse news is obviously dependent on hearing the bad news first, Lois said. She turned to Hamilton. So, yeah, bad news. Go. Hamilton pointed to the other side of the window where the shrinking gun taken from the bank robbers was sitting on a metal table as a robot arm swept its length back and forth with a laser. The bad news is this could possibly be derived from Brainiac's technology, Hamilton paused. He stroked his beard for a moment, then sighed. The potentially even worse news is, I'm afraid, possibly derived from Brainiac is as close to a definitive answer as I'll be able to get. Dick frowned. Why is that such potentially horrible news? Because, said Hamilton, not taking his eyes off of the shrinking gun on the other side of the window, there's a lot of space within that uncertainty. This could be a weapon produced by someone who somehow gained access to specifications of similar devices used by Brainiac and reproduced it. For all we know, this could be original to Brainiac himself. Either way, it would be nice to know for sure, Clark said. There's no way you can determine with more certainty where this came from? Hamilton shook his head. Unfortunately, no confirmed artifacts of Brainiac himself or the technology he produced have been discovered since the last time he and Superman faced off. If I had an example of something I knew for sure was from Brainiac, I might be able to run a comparison that would yield a more definitive conclusion. But apart from that, Hamilton shook his head. I don't know. Either way, Lois said, reaching out and patting Dick on the back, looks like this is the end of the road for you, Jimmy Jr. What? Dick asked, tilting his head. Why? I haven't looked up whether or not our liability insurance covers kids killed by supervillains while following reporters around, but I'd rather not find out. Lois turned to Clark. I think you should make sure your little buddy here gets wherever he needs to go safely while we follow this up. She's right, Clark said to Dick. I should get you home. Yeah, fine, all right, Dick said, nodding along agreeably. Whatever you think is best. I'm staying at a hotel in Midtown. I can just catch a cab or something. Ride along with him, Lois told Clark. Make sure he gets where he's supposed to be. And where will you be while I'm doing that? Asked Clark. Where I'm supposed to be, said Lois. At LexCorp, browbeating Lex for some answers. What makes you so sure Lex is behind this? Asked Clark. I'm not. Lois grinned brightly, but he's a rich asshole and it just feels really good to yell at him, even if it doesn't technically pan out for the story. She glanced at Dick and shrugged. No offense, kid. Dick shook his head. Oh, ha, believe me, none taken. Lois adjusted the strap of her messenger bag on her shoulder, said a quick goodbye to Dr. Hamilton and exited the lab. Clark and Dick made their goodbyes as well, then left the lab a few seconds behind her. By the time they got to the lobby, Lois was already outside and halfway to the corner. Wow. Dick shook his head again. Actually, I like her. She's abrasive and pushy, and she's not all that nice, so I'm not really sure why I do. But I do. Clark nodded. Yep. That's Lois Lane. <sighs> he let out a sigh. You're not actually going to hail a cab, are you? Dick asked. No, said Clark, watching until Lois turned the corner, then marching down the sidewalk in the opposite direction. Come on, I know a faster way to get you home. Whoa, whoa, said Dick, jogging to keep up with him. I'm not going home. I'm going wherever you're going. Clark slowed to a stop. Lois is right, Dick, he said. If there's a chance Brainiac is involved with this, it's not safe for you. 
If I let you come along and anything happen to you, Dick squinted at him. What? It would strain your friendship with Bruce because you two are such pals as it is? Come on, I'm here. I can take care of myself. Let me help. Clark looked down at him, hesitating for a beat. Then he took in a deep breath, exhaled, and waved for Dick to follow him as he continued down the sidewalk. Fine, you can at least come along for this next bit. But after that, no promises. All right, Dick fell into step alongside Clark. Did you bring your costume with you? Clark asked. Um, I brought a costume. Clark glanced at him from the corner of his eye. What? Asked Dick. I'm in a transitional period. Clark turned down an alleyway. Oh, is this the up, up, and away part? Dick asked, his voice a hurried whisper. Clark grinned and shook his head. He took off his glasses. This is that part. He opened up the front of his shirt, revealing the bright red and yellow emblem underneath. In less than a second, the outward appearance of Clark Kent was gone, and Dick stood there looking at Superman. So, said Superman, should I carry you? Do you want to just jump on my back? Dick's eyes narrowed. Like a piggyback ride? I suppose so. A super piggyback ride. Superman stared at him for a beat. Yes. In that case, said Dick. Absolutely. He climbed onto Superman's back, wrapping his arms around his neck. As Superman lifted off the ground, Dick leaned into his ear and said, So she totally called me Jimmy Jr., right? Superman chuckled. <laughs> Just hang on, he said, as they, rove, as they rose swiftly above the metropolis skyline. Dick's feet touched down in the snow a moment after Superman's. The two of them walked side by side up to an arch carved into the wall of the great crystalline fortress that seemed to rise directly out of the Arctic tundra. Running along, to the outside of the, running along the outside of the arch were several rows of clear crystals jutting out from the wall at seemingly random angles. At the top of the arch was a single hole, a space where a crystal should have been, but wasn't. Superman knelt, swept some snow aside, and picked another crystal up off the ground. This crystal was more opaque than the others on the wall, as though frosted from being under the snow. Superman floated up to the top of the arch and inserted this crystal into the hole. Watch your eyes, he said. The next instant, the wall inside the arch glowed so brightly that Dick instinctively threw his arm up in front of his face. A moment later, the glow subsided and the wall inside the arch was gone. Come on in, Superman said, waving Dick through the arch. When Dick was inside, Superman plucked the frosted crystal out of the hole and floated under the arch. Once he was through, the wall reappeared with another brilliant glow of light. Superman set the crystal down on an outcropping of rock that formed a shelf on the wall next to the door. That your Kryptonian key caddy? Dick asked with a smirk. Something like that. It's a cool front door and all, Dick said, eyeing the crystal, but is it really a good idea to just leave your house key outside like that? I mean, the top of the arch isn't that high. What's to stop someone from grabbing that crystal, climbing a ladder, and letting themselves in? They'd have to pick it up first, said Superman. He nodded his head toward the crystal. Go ahead. Dick walked over to the pedestal, put his hand on the crystal, and tried to lift it. The crystal didn't move. He took hold of it with both hands and tried again. Nothing. He braced his leg against the side of the pedestal and pulled with everything he had. The crystal didn't budge. Okay, Dick said, letting go of the crystal and taking a step back. So I'm guessing it's some kind of dense Kryptonian metal or something? Not exactly, said Superman. It's mostly made from the same material as the other crystals you saw out there, but I inserted a small amount of neutron star matter into the center of it. He picked up the crystal and tossed it gently into the air, catching it effortlessly a moment later. I can't say I'm the only person strong enough to lift it, he said, but it's a very short list. So what if Wonder Woman was in the neighborhood and decided to let herself in? Superman placed the crystal back down on the pedestal. She'd never drop by without, pl she'd never drop by without phoning ahead, he said with a grin. That would be rude. He walked further into the interior of the fortress, gesturing for Dick to follow him. Come on, he said. There's something over here I want to show you. 
The inside of the fortress was arranged into several plateaus of various heights, each made of the same pearlescent crystalline rock as the outer walls. It reminded Dick of the cave, if it were brighter and above ground. Superman led him to one of the higher plateaus, one with a round pedestal standing in the center. On the pedestal, beneath a glass dome, was a model of a city. It was unlike any city Dick had ever seen. Its buildings rose from wide bases into narrow spires. Ramps coiled up from the base, wrapping around the building, some running the entire length of the city. Crystals, like those that made up the fortress, only smaller, were everywhere, embedded in the architecture, decorating the facades of nearly every building beneath the dome, sparkling like fresh snow in morning sunlight. As Dick drew closer, he could perceive movement inside the glass, Tiny vehicles moved along the ramps, and smaller still, Dick's jaw fell open. Are those what I think? he asked, pointing at the city in the dome as he turned to Superman. Those are people, Superman said. He stepped closer to the dome. I'm not the last survivor of Krypton. Not exactly. Dick leaned forward on the pedestal studying the movement beneath the glass. Are they okay? They survive, said Superman. How? The environment beneath the dome is an exact replica of Krypton, said Superman. The fortress makes sure they have plenty of air, food, water, all the necessities. Dick narrowed his focus to a cluster of the tiny people moving along together on one of the ramps. Two larger ones, three smaller ones of various sizes. A family, living in a city in a bottle. Do they know? he asked. Some of them, said Superman. But it's been like this for so long, most of them have never lived any other way. Dick turned from the dome and looked up at Superman. Brainiac? Superman nodded. Candor was Krypton's capital city. Brainiac reduced it, using the same weapon he tried to use on Metropolis. I've never found a way to restore it to full size, and even if I could, I'm not sure where I could put it, you know? Yeah, said Dick softly. But, said Superman, because Candor was affected by a Brainiac weapon, I'm hoping if Dr. Hamilton can examine it, he'll be able to collect enough data to determine if the shrink ray used by those bank robbers today is Brainiac-derived tech or not. Dick tilted his head. Does Dr. Hamilton have a Brainiac detector? Because it didn't sound like he did. No, said Superman, walking around to the opposite side of the pedestal. Brainiac's technology emits a specific kind of radiation that is, that was native to Krypton. It's called Sarjan rays, after the scientist who discovered it. Candor still emits low levels of Sarjan rays even after all these years. If Dr. Hamilton can identify them, he can check to see if the weapon I took from those bank robbers today is giving off the same kind of radiation. Dick lifted his eyebrows. Not bad. And I thought the guy I worked for was the world's greatest detective. Superman watched Dick from the other side of the pedestal for a long, silent beat. Do you want to talk about what happened? Dick inhaled deeply, then sighed. I think. He took a moment to choose his words. His gaze shifted down slightly toward the surface of the pedestal, but looking at nothing in particular. I don't think I'm Robin anymore, he said. It's more than that, though, isn't it? Asked Superman, his eyes narrowing. You're transferring schools? Moving to New York? Dick shrugged. None of that has been decided. I left Wayne Manor after he and I... After we fought, and I haven't been back. I haven't even talked to him. I stayed at a hotel last week while I finished out the school year, then came here. He paused and looked around. Well, not here. Metropolis. Does he know you're safe? Asked Superman. Does anyone? Barbara knows. I talked to her about it, and I got in touch with Alfred to make sure he knew I was still going to school and not to worry about me. You know, said Superman, glancing aside, other than you and Alfred, 
I probably know better than anybody how challenging Bruce can be to get along with. But, as difficult as it may be, you should talk to him before you make any permanent changes. In fact, you may have to. Yeah, said Dick. I know. Don't close any doors, Dick, Superman said. Okay, I won't. Do you have a place to stay? In New York? Dick shrugged. I figured I'd stay with the Titans at the tower. Superman cocked an eyebrow. They'll let you stay there even if you're not an active member? That's the thing, said Dick, crossing his arms. I want to be an active member. After what happened with Bruce, the Titans are more important to me than ever. I just... I can't be Robin. Not anymore. Have you picked another name? asked Superman. Dick shook his head. No, I have no idea. <sighs> he sighed, then gestured at the city under the dome. How are you going to carry this thing all the way back to Metropolis without, you know, causing an earthquake in there? There's an internal gravity field that holds everything in place fairly well, Superman said as he reached across the pedestal and took hold of the dome with both hands. But to really answer your question, he said as he lifted the city off the table and pulled it in against his chest very carefully. As they made their way back to the entrance, Superman inclined his head toward Dick and asked, who won the fight? Wasn't much of a fight, said Dick. A grin pulled at the corners of his mouth. Just two hits, really. Me hitting him and him hitting the floor. Superman blinked. Wouldn't have guessed you'd be a fan of the Breakfast Club. He shifted Candor to one arm and picked up the key crystal with the other. A moment later, the archway glowed and opened to the outside. What's the Breakfast Club? Superman shook his head. Next time you visit, we'll have to do movie night. Movie night? Here? I didn't even see a TV, said Dick as he followed Superman out. A moment later, the archway sealed itself, and the fortress was silent. Clark and Dick were sitting at Clark's desk eating tacos when Lois stomped back into the office. She pulled her messenger bag off of her shoulder, dropped it loudly on her desk, which was directly across from Clark's, and sank heavily into her chair. "'How's Lex?' asked Clark, nibbling a stray shred of lettuce into his mouth and swallowing. "'Lex? Lex is just great,' Lois said, throwing up her arms. "'He was all too happy to discuss any number of exciting new LexCorp technologies with me, none of which happened to be a shrinking gun.' She glared across at Clark's desk. "'Did you get tacos?' Dick picked up the bag and tossed it over onto Lois's desk. There's two left. Help yourself. Lois dug a taco out of the bag and unwrapped it on her desk in front of her. Your treat, she asked, glancing at Dick. You could have had Clark spring for dinner. Wouldn't want the trust fund to run out. I did spring for dinner, actually, said Clark, reaching for his soda. Why does everyone have to mention the trust fund? Dick asked balling up the wrapper of the taco he'd just finished and tossing it into the waste can next to Clark's desk. A buzzing sound came from Lois's desk. She pulled her messenger bag toward her and dug out her phone. Oh, she said, reading the text message that had just come through. Dr. Hamilton had a visit from Superman earlier. He gave him a way to test if the gun was from Brainiac. Did I tell you that already? We heard, said Clark, setting his soda back on his desk. Well, he just texted me to say the test results were negative, said Lois, holding up her phone. He said there was some kind of special brainiac radiation he was looking for, and he couldn't find any on the gun. She tossed her phone back into her bag and pushed it away from her across the desk. So, there goes that. Dick leaned back in his chair, folded his arms, and adjusted his glasses. Just because Luther says the shrinking gun wasn't his doesn't mean that's the truth, he said. You think? said Lois, through a mouthful of taco. She swallowed hard. What we need to do is to get a look at what his R&D department has been working on lately. Even if there isn't a line item that says shrink ray, we'd be able to tell if they were working on something like that from what they were doing, what components they were ordering, etc., etc. We would? asked Clark with a skeptical tilt of his head. Well, we'd show whatever we found to Dr. Hamilton and he'd be able to tell. Then he'd tell us, said Lois, smiling and raising her eyebrows. Great, 
Clark placed his hands behind his head and stretched his legs. So, all we have to do is gain access to internal LexCorp files in such a way that Luther can't trace it back to us and have us arrested, and also probably end up owning the planet as part of the settlement of the lawsuit he would also definitely file. Dick sat forward in his chair and contemplated the floor. Yep, said Lois, that's all. She popped the last bite of taco into her mouth. What about disgruntled former employees? Dick asked, looking up. Lois leveled her gaze at him. Go on. Well, a shrink ray is fairly advanced tech. Even if LexCorp isn't working on one now, that doesn't mean they weren't working on one at some point. Maybe someone's pet project got canceled, or they got fired, or they went into business for themselves. Lois pondered that for a moment. Scientists who worked on projects related to or inspired by Brainiac Tech who have since left their jobs, she said, turning to Clark. That's worth checking out. Clark reached for his phone. I'll call Inspector Henderson and see if he can get us any names. Where's the bathroom? Dick asked. The little boy's room is down that hallway to the right, said Lois, pointing behind her, the barest trace of a grin on her face. Thanks, said Dick flatly. Be right back. Lois watched him over her shoulder as he walked away. Low tolerance for Mexican food, she observed, turning back to Clark. We can't all have your iron stomach, Lois, said Clark. It's a cross some of us just have to bear. You'd know all about that, Lois said with a chuckle. I've never known anyone who runs to the bathroom as suddenly as you do. And sometimes you're in there forever. Clark shrugged. When you gotta go. Dick turned the corner and started down the hallway. He walked past the restrooms to the end of the hall, where he saw the doorway to a stairwell. He pushed through the door and trotted down the stairs to the next landing, taking his phone from his pocket as he went. A few seconds later, he heard Barbara's voice, saying, Hey, I was wondering when you were going to call me. He could hear the smile in her voice. Hi, he said through a smile of his own. How are you? Good, she said. How are you? Also, where are you? Metropolis, he said. I did that thing I said I might do. And? Did you talk to him? Did he bring your life into focus with his kind yet pragmatic advice? No, he... Are you making fun of me? Barbara gasped. Oh, that is hurtful, man. I thought you knew me better than that. I do know you, he said. That's why I asked. Well, maybe a little. Dick laughed. <laughs> I knew it. But seriously, though, did you talk? A little bit. I told him the basics earlier at the Fortress of Solitude. He thinks I should keep Bruce in the loop and not burn any bridges. Listen to you name-dropping the Fortress of Solitude like it's no big deal. He laughed and shook his head. <laughs> Give me a break. Anyway, she said, sensible advice about not burning bridges. She was quiet for a few seconds. When she spoke again, her voice was softer than before. So, what's up? I assume you're not calling to cash in that rain check for dinner. I wish I were, Dick said. Actually, I'm here at the planet and... Name dropping again! God, you can't stop yourself! Dick could see her wicked grin as clearly as if she were standing next to him. And there's something we could use a hand with, he considered, enunciating deliberately. You wouldn't happen to be in the cave, would you? As a matter of fact, I just showed up to start my workout about ten minutes ago. I thought maybe. What do you need? Well, said Dick, leaning back against the wall, facing the steps leading down. If the computer still has that back door into LexCorp, and if you could use that to get me the names and addresses of former employees, say from R&D who were working on projects related to Brainiac within the last few years and have since left, or better yet, been fired, that would be amazing. Oh, is that all? Anything else I can do for you as long as I'm in there? Dick thought a second. Actually, yeah, can you dig into Star Labs files for the same kind of thing? While I'm at it, want me to redirect some of Lex's salary into your checking account, maybe? Lex doesn't officially take a salary, said Dick. Get me a piece of his stock dividend. Barbara laughed. <laughs> Why Brainiac-related projects out of curiosity? Wait, let me guess. It has something to do with Brainiac. 
It doesn't look like he's directly involved, but earlier today, Superman nabbed a gang of bank robbers who were packing a shrink ray. A shrink ray? asked Barbara, incredulous. She took a beat. What is it with Metropolis? They get all the fun stuff. All we ever get are costume serial killers. I'll take that as a no, then. When do you need this stuff by? ASAP would be nice if you can swing it. I can swing it, she said. But you're going to owe me. I'll pay in full next time I see you. Promise? He smiled softly. Promise. Okay, she said cheerfully. I'll see what I can do. I'll email you. Thanks, Barb. Anytime. He put his phone away and walked back to Clark and Lois's desk. Clark was on his phone, turned away in his chair. Inspector Henderson, Dick asked, pointing at Clark with his thumb. Lois nodded, seeing if we can get some names. Dick leaned against Lois's desk. So he's like your Commissioner Gordon, he asked, folding his arms. Lois stared up at him. Implying what? Dick held her gaze, considering his next words carefully. Just that in Gotham, everybody knows that Commissioner Gordon is Batman's ally. I see, said Lois, leaning back in her chair. So if Inspector Henderson is our Commissioner Gordon, that makes Clark and me who? Batman and Robin? Dick grinned. <laughs> no, you're not Batman and Robin. But you're not cops either. Henderson seems willing to step outside the law occasionally to help you out if it's the right thing. That's all I meant. Sure, 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 said Lois, making a winding motion with her finger. Let's go back a step, though. If Clark and I are Batman and Robin, she leaned forward, folding her hands on her desk. Which is which? Oh, said Dick, without hesitation, as if it was the easiest question he'd ever been asked. Clark is Robin, no doubt. Lois smiled. That was the right answer. I guess that's a compliment, she said. But I'm better than Batman. She tapped her finger on the desk. I'm a reporter. Dick glanced to the side for a moment. Henderson works with Superman too, doesn't he? He asked. Pretty sure I read that somewhere, he added a moment later. He does, said Lois. And? And Superman is a vigilante too, isn't he? Lois narrowed her eyes. I guess he is, she said. But you're forgetting a very important distinction between Superman and Batman. What's that? Superman is Superman. Dick snorted. <laughs> I don't think any of us are likely to forget that. Clark ended his call with Inspector Henderson and turned around to face them. He said it might not be until tomorrow, but he's going to call me back when he's got names and addresses, he said, waving his phone before tucking it back into his pocket. A moment later, Dick's phone dinged. Is that your girlfriend? Lois asked as Dick read his screen. That question is way more complicated than you probably intended, Dick said. Ah, ah, said Lois, wagging her finger. The answer to that question is way more complicated than you probably want it to be. She grinned. Don't worry, kid. They'll set you straight at Pennington. Wow, this is great. Thanks, Dick muttered under his breath as he typed out a reply to the message he just received. Good news? Asked Clark. Oh, ill, said Lois. You're not sexting, are you? I know you probably think you're at that age, but trust me, you are way too young for that. Plus, if you're on company Wi-Fi, she snapped her head toward Clark. You didn't give him the password, did you? We're not sexting, said Dick, shaking his head. So, said Lois, craning her neck to get a peek at his phone. What did she send you that's so great? Dick showed the screen of his phone to her. Just some names and addresses. Lois snatched Dick's phone out of his hand. What? Are these real? She asked, studying the screen. They're real, Dick said. I trust the source. He paused, glancing aside. Is that journalist talk? It sounds like journalist talk. What have we got? Asked Clark. Erica Dembele, formerly a researcher at LexCorp's Special Projects Division, and uh, Joanna Geist, formerly a member of the atomic physics teams at Star Labs Metropolis, said Lois, reading from Dick's phone. Both resigned from their positions within the last two years. Both had been working on projects related to decreasing the amount of empty space between atoms in order to reduce the size of objects. And, Lois said, looking up from the phone, both had their projects canceled shortly before they left. She typed something into Dick's phone. What are you doing? He asked. 
Sending myself and Clark a copy of this, she said. The phone played a whooshing sound effect as she sent the email. Tell Barbara I said thanks, she said with a smirk as she handed the phone back to Dick. Clark reached for his phone again and opened the email he'd just received. So, he said as he read it, your girlfriend is a hacker? First, she's not my girlfriend. Not really, said Dick. And second, like I said, I trust the source. You can wait until you get confirmation from Henderson if you want, but I'm telling you, those are the names you're looking for. All right, Clark said, placing his phone on his desk. Assuming these are good names, who do we talk to first? Lois frowned. What do you mean? There's two of them. There's two of us. We each take one and we talk to them at the same time. Clark sighed. Lois, if one of these people is making advanced weaponry and giving it to criminals, they could be very dangerous. Yes, well, if they are, said Lois, I'm sure they'll think twice about messing with me if they see I've brought along the water boy for the Smallville High football team. I was the equipment manager, Clark muttered into his chest. Erica Dembele, Lois said, checking her phone, then dropping it back into her messenger bag. She's who I'm taking. You take the other one. She stood up and slung the bag over her shoulder. Call me if I don't call you first and let me know if you get anything from her. Lois, Clark said as she walked past him to the elevators. I know I'm wasting my breath, but if you run into trouble, get out of there. Or at least call. Don't worry, Clark. If I need help, I'll call. She paused and turned to face him. Just not you. She grinned, spun around on her heel, and walked away. So, Dick said, slipping his hands into his pockets, Joanna Geist, observing your interview with her could be quite instructive for a possibly aspiring reporter such as myself. Clark got up from his chair. You can tag along, he said, but what I said to Lois just now goes for you too. If we run into trouble, you're getting out of there. Understand? Understand, Dick said as they started for the elevators. If you get in a jam, I'll immediately abandon you. That's all I ask, said Clark as he pushed the elevator button. They stepped off the stairs that descended from the train station and headed down the weathered sidewalk. Riding the L with Superman, mused Dick. Never thought I'd be doing that. Statistically speaking, it's the most efficient way to get around the city, Clark said with a shrug. For most people, anyway. I'll take your word for it, said Dick, as they approached a shabby building that loomed ahead on the right. The building was surrounded by half-dead, unmowed grass, the perimeter of the property enclosed by a rusting chain-link fence. No trespassing signs were attached to the fence every 10 feet or so. Though, a train stop here doesn't strike me as very efficient. Not now, said Clark, but 10 years ago, this was Nanocore, a company that contracted with Star Labs to manufacture miniaturized technology. It was a major employer in this part of the city. What happened? Same old story. Star Labs had to cut its budget. Nanocore lost the contract and couldn't replace the revenue. The company went under. They came to a gate. It's two halves wrapped together with a chain and secured with a heavy padlock. So what, said Dick, staring at the building through the fence. She lives here now, Dr. Geist? No, said Clark, shaking his head. She has an apartment a few minutes from here. Clark narrowed his eyes as he studied the building, but she's in there. Clark reached up and removed his glasses. Remember what I said about what to do if we run into trouble? Yeah, said Dick. Do it. Clark turned and jogged across the street. Dick watched him disappear down an alley between two vacant apartment buildings. A moment later, a blue figure flew high overhead, arcing back toward the old nanocore facility, his red cape fluttering in the wind. Dick glanced down the sidewalk toward the train station. Nah, he whispered, pulling out his phone. He found Clark's number in his contacts. After a few rings, Clark's voicemail answered. Hey, Clark, said Dick, I know you're away from your phone at the moment. Just wanted to tell you that while you're busy, I'm going to take a walk over to Dr. Geist's apartment and have a look around. Just thought you'd want to know. He lowered his phone to end the call, but stopped and brought it back to his ear. This is Dick, by the way. He hung up, tucked his phone back into his pocket, and started across the street. He was halfway to the other side when a bright blue flash of light lit up the entire block. Dick stopped, looked over his shoulder. The flash had come from behind him, from inside the nanocore building. He turned on his heel, sprinted back across the street, 
and leapt toward the fence, grabbing the top with both hands and hauling himself over. The nearest entrance to the building was locked. Dick resisted his initial impulse to kick his way through it and instead moved to a nearby row of windows. He cupped his hands around his eyes and leaned close to the glass, but couldn't see anything but a darkened space occupied by motionless, dust-covered equipment. Dick jogged to the end of the building and rounded the corner. Between two windows was a ladder bolted to the wall, running all the way to the roof. Dick scrambled up and over the top, jumping off the last rung and crouching low against the parapet. Across the roof, on the other side of a cluster of air conditioner units, was a door. Dick ran to it. When he reached it, he saw that the door had been forced open, the doorknob crushed and wrenched off its screws. Dick stepped through the door and started cautiously down the metal staircase that descended into the building. Soups, I don't know if you can hear me, he said quietly as he went, but I'm flagrantly ignoring your orders. I hope that's okay. He came to a catwalk that stretched high above the floor, from one side of the building to the other. Then again, he continued, you're not technically my boss. Come to think of it, I don't have a boss, so. He crossed toward the center of the catwalk and looked down across the floor of the building, which was wide open except for a closed-in section in a far corner, which Dick assumed to be an office area. Dick could see a light on in one of the offices and the shadow of someone moving back and forth. Equipment was arranged all around the floor. An abandoned assembly line, a bank of computers, a row of machine presses, a mechanical arm with what looked like a laser attached to the end. The only portion of the floor that was free of machinery or computers was a circular area almost directly below the center of the catwalk. Dick lifted his head to look at the ceiling. Mounted to the rafters, pointing down toward the empty area of the floor, were several gray metal boxes. Attached to the largest of these boxes by a coiled length of thick insulated wire was a kind of nozzle with a blue crystal protruding a few inches from its tip. Dick looked back down at the empty area of the floor below. He squinted as he realized he was wrong. The floor wasn't empty. There was a collection of tiny objects in the center of the circular area. They were difficult to make out from this height, but they looked almost like toy versions of the full-size equipment distributed throughout the rest of the building. Dick went back to the stairs and took them the rest of the way down to the floor. He jogged toward the clear area. Dick, stay back, he heard a faint, high-pitched voice say. He stopped. He looked around. He saw no one. What? he said hesitantly, not quite sure he'd actually heard it. Don't come any closer, the voice said again. It was coming from the center of the clear area of the floor. Ignoring the advice of the voice, Dick moved closer. On the floor, surrounded by miniature machinery, was a glass dome, a bell jar. And inside the bell jar, standing there looking up at him. Dick, stop, cried the teeny tiny Superman in the jar, holding out both hands, a crack in his puny squeak of a voice. Stopping short a few feet from the jar, Dick tried and failed to suppress a huge grin. Um, hey, he said. What happened? Take two big steps back, said Superman, who looked to be about five inches tall. You're inside the range of the device. If she fires it again, you'll be reduced in size just like me. Dick stepped away from the jar. Is that two big steps for me or two big steps for you? This is serious, Dick, Squ squeaked Superman sternly. I told you to get to safety. Get out of here. Why don't we both get out of here, said Dick. Can't you lift that jar? It doesn't look that heavy. He snickered. <laughs> Even for a little guy like you. The shrink ray is affecting my power somehow, said Superman. My strength is gone. Are you sure it's gone, Dick asked, or do you just have the proportionate strength of a teensy tiny Superman? Superman sighed, which sounded like air escaping from an annoyed balloon. Hmm. If you're going to help me, then help me. Get over here and pick this jar up. Is it safe to get that close? I don't think it fires automatically, or it would have when you stepped inside the range a moment ago, Superman said. Just hurry up and free me before she comes back. Okay, said Dick, shuffling over to the jar. Hold tight, little fella. He squatted next to the jar, grabbed it by the top with his right hand, and lifted. The jar didn't move. Dick tried again with both hands. Nothing. 
Oh, come on, he said. Why can't I pick anything up today? The jar has been reduced in size by the shrink ray, too, said Superman. It must still have the same density, which makes it heavier. Try again. Dick set his feet, grabbed the jar again with both hands, and pulled with all his strength. The jar shifted slightly, but he knew there was no way he could move it enough to allow Superman to escape. Lift with your knees, squeaked Superman urgently. I'm trying, said Dick, unable to stop himself from giggling. He let go of the jar and fell back on his rear end and started to laugh. This isn't funny, Dick. This is serious, said teensy tiny Superman. Trust me, said Dick, trying to get his laughter under control. <laughs> from this side of the jar, <laughs> it's pretty damn funny. Superman lifted off the floor and floated to the top of the jar. Oh, cool, said Dick. You can still fly. Look at you. You like a little pixie. I'll push from this side, Superman said, wrinkling his brow. You lift from that side. Maybe together we can move it. Sounds like a plan. Dick grabbed the top of the jar, checked his footing, and said, Ready? Go! Dick lifted up, his arms and legs burning from the effort. Inside the jar, Superman pushed against the top as hard as he could. After what felt like a very long time, Dick felt the jar move. Oh! He gasped. It's moving! Push more to your right. I think maybe we can tip it. Dick repositioned himself slightly and began pulling the jar up and to one side, opening a crack between the jar and the floor. When the crack was about half an inch wide, Superman said, Hold it there! I'll try to squeeze through! Hold it there? Are you kidding me? This thing weighs a ton! Superman dropped back to the floor and made for the opening. Dick felt the jar slipping from his hands, so he did the only thing he could think of to keep it from tipping back down. He used his last bit of strength to wrench the crack open as wide as he could and shoved his foot underneath it. A moment later, he had to release his grip. The weight of the jar came to rest across the tops of his toes. I'm through, Superman said, standing up on the outside of the jar. Let's get clear of this thing. Love to, said Dick, grimacing. But, oh, Jesus, Jesus Christ, how big was this thing when she shrank it? Superman crouched under the rim of the jar and helped Dick to lift it. Dick pulled his foot out and the jar dropped to the floor with a thunk. Dick crab walked back away from the jar, stopping a few feet beyond the clear circle on the floor that presumably indicated the range of the shrink ray. Is that her in there? Dick asked, nodding toward the offices. Yes, said Superman, flying up to hover above Dick's shoulder. After she shrank me and trapped me under that glass, she ran in there. My hearing isn't as good as like... My hearing isn't as good like this. But I thought I heard her opening a safe. Superman glanced over and noticed Dick staring at him. What? You're like the devil on my shoulder, Dick said. Why devil? Because you're on the left side, said Dick. Isn't that the sinister side? Superman sighed heavily, which came out as a low whistle. And floated over to Dick's right shoulder. We're in a lot of danger here, and I need you to take this seriously. Got it said Dick with a nod. What about your x-ray vision? Can you see what she took out of the safe? My visual powers have been diminished too, he said. Plus, I'm almost certain she has a lot of lead lining in that office, which doesn't give me a good feeling. No, I don't suppose it would, Dick said, watching the office door. He took a deep breath and exhaled. Okay, here's the plan. I go in there, I take her out, I make sure there's no glowing green stuff around, I get her to re-enlarge you, and we're good. He looked over at Superman. How's that sound? We don't know if she can re-enlarge me, he said. Oh, of course she can, said Dick. He cracked his knuckles and started toward the offices. It's probably just a dial she needs to turn back to the other side or something. What if she has another shrinking gun? Asked Superman, flying alongside Dick. Like the one the bank robbers I stopped were carrying. Then I guess I'll have to not get shot by it, said Dick, looking right at Superman for a beat. She had it set to a wide beam, Superman insisted. You saw it. She shrank me and everything around me. I didn't even have a chance to get out of the way. Dick flattened his back against the wall next to the door into the office. Okay, he said. If we can't rebig you, that's the story we'll go with. I'll back you up. He reached out slowly and gripped the doorknob. Stay back until I know it's safe, he whispered. Like you did? asked Superman, cocking an eyebrow. Dick conceded the point with a shrug. She's 
She's in the room right behind this door, said Superman, squinting at the wall. Behind a desk, fumbling with something. Tough to tell what it is. Dick nodded. He twisted the knob, threw open the door, and dove inside. He rolled to the corner diagonally across the room from the desk where Dr. Geist was, ducking behind a filing cabinet. What the hell? yelled Geist, dropping something that was in her hand and scrambling to pick it back up. Who are you? Dr. Geist, whatever this is, it's over now, Dick yelled, peeking around the filing cabinet. Superman caught your bank crew this morning, we've got your shrinking gun, and now that we know you're here, the cops will be here any minute. Also, I let tiny Superman out of the jar. He's really unhappy with the whole situation. Dick heard a clicking sound, like something locking into place. A moment later, a green glow filled the room, and the cabinet Dick was hiding behind disappeared. Dick found it on the floor in front of him, so tiny he took it for a speck of dirt at first. Dr. Geist leveled her new shrinking gun at Dick. Superman's days of meddling in my business are over, she said. She pulled the trigger. Dick rolled out of the way. The beam connected with a chair that had been behind him, shrinking it down almost out of sight. So you're going full bore supervillain then, said Dick, standing. Works for me. Do you want to monologue about your grand plan or your motivations or anything before I end this? Who are you? Dr. Geist asked again wincing and pointing the shrinking gun at Dick. Just a concern to the trigger, halfway back before Superman's miniaturized fist connected with her jaw, knocking her off balance. As she flailed backwards, Geist fired the gun. The beam shot across the, shot across the office, reflected off a mirror hung on the wall to her right, and connected with the floor where the tiny filing cabinet was. A moment later, the filing cabinet popped back to its normal size. Dick charged across the office, wrenching the gun from her hand and bending her arm behind her back. Hey, thanks, Dick said, putting the gun down on the desk. He reached down to a power outlet on the wall near his feet, unplugged a cord, and traced it back to the base of a lamp on the desk. That bit with the mirror is really helpful. We were wondering about that. He yanked the cord out of the lamp with a sharp jerk, then used it to tie the hands of Dr. Geist. Dick pulled a rolling chair over, spun Geist around, and pushed her down into the chair. He turned to Superman, who was again hovering over his right shoulder. Thanks, Jiminy. <sighs> okay, am I back? Sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, but uh, yes, Dana, I turned it off and turned it back on. And now we're back. So anyway... Um, so let me just make sure that the um, wait, wait for the live chat to catch up with me um, and make sure that we're back on. Everything's good. I am back. All right. So where were we? Um, the la according to people's reactions in the live chat, the last bit that you saw or heard was um, when Dr. Geist said, uh, and maybe Badgie could help. Nice, John. Um, when Dr. Geist said uh, that it was that Superman was done meddling in her business, right? So, <clears throat> who are you? Thank you, Dana. Who are you? Dr. Geist asked again, wincing, pointing the shrinking gun at Dick. Just a concerned citizen, he said with a shrug. A malicious grin spread over Geist's face. Well, your worries are about to be over. She squeezed the trigger halfway, halfway back before Superman's miniaturized fist connected with her jaw, knocking her off balance. As she flailed backwards, Geist fired the gun. The beam shot across the office, reflected off a mirror hung on the wall to her right, and connected with the floor where the tiny filing cabinet was. A moment later, the filing cabinet popped back to its normal size. Dick charged across the office, wrenching the gun from her hand and bending her arm behind her back. Hey, thanks, Dick said, putting the gun down on the desk. He reached down to a power outlet near, on the wall near his feet, unplugged a cord, and traced it back to the base of a lamp on the desk. That bit with the mirror is really helpful. We were wondering about that. He yanked the cord out of the lamp with a sharp jerk, then used it to tie the hands of Dr. Geist. Dick pulled a rolling chair over, spun Geist around, and pushed her down into the chair. He turned to Superman, who was again hovering near his right shoulder. Thanks, Jiminy! Superman laughed, which sounded like a baby being tickled after a hit from a helium balloon. <laughs> you should probably call the police for real, he said. Good idea, said Dick, pulling out his phone. He dialed with one hand 
and picked up the shrinking gun from the desk with another, with the other. A nice clean piece of business, he said. He gestured toward the mirror with the gun, adding, we even know how to re-enlarge you. Yes, said Superman, raising an eyebrow, backing away. But let's use the other gun. Oh, said Dick, glancing at the glowing green crystal at the tip of the gun in his hand. He put it back on the desk. Ha! <laughs> right. Lois ended her call and dropped her phone back into her messenger bag. Geist lawyered up, but Henderson doesn't think that'll be too much of an issue. I mean, she had multiple shrink rays virtually identical to the one the bank robbers had, and they're probably going to flip on her as soon as they find out how much time they're looking at. What's the maximum penalty for attempting to rob a bank with a shrink ray? asked Dick, grinning as he leaned against Clark's desk. I guess we'll find out, said Clark, arching back into his chair, stretching his legs to rest his feet on his desk. Did Henderson say anything about why she did it, asked Dick, or why she just so happened to have a kryptonite shrink ray with her? Apparently, the kryptonite thing was just a coincidence, said Lois. I asked Hamilton about that, and he speculated that something about the radiation emitted by kryptonite amplifies the shrink ray's effect. If she had managed to hit Superman with it, it would not only have killed him, it would have reduced him in size so much we'd probably never have found him. Lucky for Superman, that concerned citizen showed up to lend a hand, said Clark, glancing at Dick. Assuming the account the cops got from Dr. Geist can be trusted, that is. Maybe she just wanted to save face after being defeated by teensy tiny Superman, interrupted Dick, looking back at Clark with a knowing gleam in his eye. Well, whoever that idiot was, he must have had something to hide, said Lois. Otherwise, he would have stuck around until the police showed up. I don't know, Lois, said Clark, pulling his legs off the desk and sitting forward in his chair. Maybe he was just shy. Lois wrinkled her brow. Is that what you would have done, she asked Clark? Help Superman save the day, then just slip away without saying a word? She shook her head. Your small town Midwestern humility. Dick smiled. Makes you sick, doesn't it? It really does. Clark saw Jimmy rounding the corner out of the hallway and heading toward the elevators. Hey, Jimmy, he called, waving him over. How was orientation with the new interns? Hey, CK, said Jimmy as he approached. It was all right, though I'd rather have gone out on that story with you and Miss Lane. Sounds like I missed all the fun. Lois shrugged. Meh. Well, said Dick, I'm not as used to it as you seasoned journalists, but I had a blast. I'm just sorry I forgot to take pictures. He gave a shrug. Though, he said, setting his gaze on Jimmy, I guess a really well-written story doesn't need any illustration. He stared straight-faced at Jimmy for as long as he could before finally cracking a smile. Jimmy glared at him. You'd be surprised, he said. Anyway, I'm on my way home. See you two tomorrow, he said, glancing at Clark and Lois. He gave Dick a quick nod, then turned and headed for the elevators. So... Asked Lois, looking at Dick, leaning forward on her desk. Does this affect your decision? You going to study journalism at Pennington or what? I don't know, actually, Dick said. He looked across the newsroom at Jimmy, stepping onto the elevator. Maybe I'll try photography instead. Lois rolled her eyes. Well, good luck, she said, letting out a contented sigh as she pushed her chair away from the desk and stood. She grabbed her messenger bag and slung it over her shoulder. See you and my byline first thing tomorrow, Clark, she said, and started across the floor toward the elevators. So where are you two off? Where, so where are you off to after this? Asked Clark, leaning back in his chair. My hotel room for room service and sleep, Dick said, stretching his arms out over his head. Tomorrow, I think I'll head to New York. Clark nodded. He looked around the newsroom, then turned back to Dick. You got a few minutes? Sure. What for? Clark glanced upward. Ever seen the roof of this place? A few minutes later, they were standing at the base of the great spinning globe that topped the Daily Planet building. Metropolis stretched out below, reaching all the way to the water that glistened in the moonlight in the distance. Dick walked to the edge of the roof. Nice view, he said, turning to Clark. I've always thought so, Clark said, walking up beside him. I'm up here a lot. It's a great place to be alone and think. Don't you already have one of those? asked Dick, cocking an eyebrow. The fortress is for Superman. 
This. Clark took a deep breath and looked around. This is for Clark. They're both you, though, said Dick. Clark nodded. Both me. I need them both. I am them both. He looked at Dick for a beat. I think you know what I mean. I do, Dick said. I definitely do. I just... He turned away to look across the city. I don't know what to do next. Clark looked at his feet. He thought quietly for a moment. So, he said, lifting his head. In Candor, on Krypton, long before Brainiac shrank the city, legend has it there was a hero. He belonged to a powerful family, but he was cast out. Instead of living in resentment against those who had rejected him, he turned his energies outward. He became a champion of the people. He fought crime. He challenged corrupt authority. He became a symbol of truth and justice. Dick smiled softly. Sounds familiar. What was his name? Clark turned toward him. Nightwing. Nightwing, Dick repeated. He nodded. He has a certain ring to it. And, as far as I know, said Clark, it's available. Dick looked out again, his gaze distant for a long, silent moment. Thank you, he said. Don't mention it, said Clark, clapping Dick lightly on the shoulder. So, let me ask you something, Dick said. Candor. Is there any chance that trick we used to bring you back to normal size, reflecting the shrink ray off the mirror, would work for that? Clark shook his head. Professor Hamilton doesn't think so. Geist's shrink ray isn't nearly powerful enough, and even if it were, re-enlarging Candor without damaging anything or anyone inside would be... Well, it's not in the cards, I'm afraid. Yet, Dick added. And Clark smiled. Yet, he agreed. Speaking of which, Clark said, checking his watch, I need to change and go pick up Candor from Star Labs so I can register, so I can return it to the fortress. He glanced out. He reached out and put his hand on Dick's shoulder. But if you need anything, don't hesitate to call. All right? Dick nodded. I won't. Dick's phone buzzed in his pocket. He pulled it out and looked at it. That's Barbara, he said. Hmm, said Clark. Think it's important? Dick hesitated, then nodded. Might be. Clark lowered his gaze to Dick's phone as he backed away. Then that's what you do next, he said. He turned and started toward the door to the stairwell. Hey, Clark heard Dick say into the phone as he started down the steps, pulling the door shut behind him. And that's the end, everybody. <laughs> so, I hope everybody liked it. That's 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 the end of the uh, of the story. And unfortunately, this time I don't have a bonus scene to read you like I did last time, where I read you like I had also written the scene where where Dick like actually punches out Batman. I don't I don't have an extra scene this time. So that's it. Um, anyway, thoughts, opinions. Radical Bacon. So the Pennington School. Yes, that is a Deep Space Nine reference. I saw you. I saw you mention that in the uh, in the chat earlier. Yes, the Pennington School is a Deep Space Nine reference, of course. And uh, what else? Levine Street is after Deborah Joy Levine, who was the uh, associate producer or the executive producer and kind of the showrunner of Lois and Clark. Yeah, so random. Yeah, Dick does Metropolis with the adventures of teensy tiny Superman. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, oh, thank you, Seth. Yeah, yeah. I, the first one um, is uh, the first one is archived on my channel. If you want to listen to the first one, um, that first, the first one, the, the one previous to this one, um, the Dick and Barbara story is is much closer to my heart. But uh, but I, I, I'm really pleased with how this one turned out, and I'm I'm, I'm glad that, that you uh, you seem to you you guys who are who listened seemed to uh, enjoy it because I really, I think it really turned out really well. I, I thought it, it, it feel, it feels kind of like, uh, 
like a Silver Age story, you know, with the shrink ray and the humor, you know, stuff like that. Um, so I'm going to, yeah, I'm glad you like it. Oh, thank you. Some random geek. Yes. There's the Seth. There's the link to the first one. Um, yeah. Oh, so yeah. And actually I think even with the little, uh, technical snafu there, I think I actually got through it this time a little faster than I did when I did my timed read earlier today, because I, I had to run my, my mouth a little bit at the beginning before I actually started reading. And then even with the little technical delay and having to go back over some of it, I, I, I got through it in um, probably, well, it was probably about an hour and 15 minutes or so. Um, so yeah. Oh, oh, thank you very much. As a Stephen Stuffy fan, I put this up there with that. Well, that is really, that is really nice. That I take, I definitely take that as a compliment. So yeah. Um, yeah. Robert loved that Dick still got Candor, still, still got Nightwing from Candor. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I mean, I wanted to keep that. I really like that little detail and I, I like, you know, him sort of going to Superman for guidance. I think that's a cool, you know, character beat. Um, uh, hi says, when will be the next face palm five this coming Monday? Seth says time to submit to DC. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I mean, I like, if I could, if they would hire me and if they would give me the editorial freedom to, uh, to write, you know, what I wanted to write, that would be, obviously that would be one of my dream jobs. It's just, you know, I don't know. I don't know how well I would do under like the corporate structure where it's like, you know, oh, I have these great ideas for stories. Let, let's say it's Superman. I have these great ideas for Superman stories. And then, you know, the word from on high comes down and says, yeah, 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 that's great. But you, you need to carve out like half the year to write tie-ins for whatever our bullshit, massive company-wide crossover is this year. Like, I just, I don't think I would dig that. I mean, I might dig the challenge of it a little bit, maybe. Um, but, uh, yeah. Oh, some random geek. Yeah. Lo I, Lois came across, Lois came across very good in the story. I agree. I, um, yeah, I, th I, I think, I think Lois came across very good. Lois is one of the best parts of the story. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you enjoy her. Um, <laughs> Seth, in my mind, do they stay stories, graphic novels, TV? Uh, it, it, I see it as a story. I mean, I think most of my fanfic could be, could probably be adapted. I mean, of course it could be if it, with a good enough adaptation. I mean, it could be, it could be a, a comic or a TV show. It would probably work better as a TV show or a movie than as a comic, just because I like to, um, I, I tend to write heavily toward conversation and toward sort of quiet moments. And I don't know how well, I mean, if, if you have a talented enough artist, you can, you can pull that off in comics, but comics doesn't necessarily lend itself to sort of quiet beats and subtle character moments, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I see it as a story. I mean, I wrote it as a story and I see it as a story. Um, so yeah, yeah. I'm glad everybody seemed to like it. That's really cool. There will be more, there will be more, um, my writing partner and I are, uh, are working on more as we speak. I don't know when the next one will be ready or when that one will get read or if it will get read or whatever, but there, there, there are definitely a lot more DC universe fanfic stories in the pipeline for sure. It's going to be, it's, yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. Some random geeky. I think it would work as a radio play. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Put in some sound effects. You know, that it would be, um, oh, thanks Dana, because it was good. You dumbass. You give me a wonderful compliment and then you just, you know, make sure that my head doesn't get too big. Right. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you liked it. I'm really, really glad you liked it. Um, and yeah, there will, there will definitely be more. It feels good to write fanfic again. I, I I wrote fanfic a lot when I was a teenager and even in a little bit into like my young adult period, you know, maybe early 20s. And then I kind of got out of it. Um, and I've been writing it a lot more lately. And it feels really, really good. It feels really, really good. Because um, it's something, it was one of the things that, that sort of helped me to develop my voice as a writer. I think actually I would recommend, I would recommend writing fanfic to people who are starting to develop as a writer, you know, if you want to figure out your voice and, and especially figure out like the mechanics of storytelling, 
because you start with pre-made characters that if you're writing fanfic about a fandom that you care about, you, you presumably already know these characters. So, you know, you can just sort of hit the ground running and you're playing in someone else's sandbox, but you're building your own sandcastle, you know, and it really helps you. I found it really helps you, you know, practice. And also it's just fun in its own right. Like it's fun to, you know, to write a Superman story or write a Batman story. Um, uh, how long does it take to write something like this? Uh, how, how long did this one take? This one took a couple weeks. Um, I didn't work on it every single day. I mean, I wasn't like slaving away at it every single day, but, um, it took a couple weeks to finish and I fin I actually, I finished it, what, two days ago, three days ago. I, I think I, well, I, f I finished the draft a few days ago and I've been kind of picking at it and tweaking it ever since. Um, yeah. And, uh, Some random geek. I also enjoyed Dick and Bab's dialogue in this one too. I'm really glad because I love. I, as I told you before, um, as I said when I read the last fic, and as I said, I think on uh, uh, like a, an ask away recently, um, Dick and Babs, Dick Grayson and Barbara Gordon are, are are characters that I feel very very close to on a personal level, and I love them both, and I love and I'm very attached to the idea of them being together and you know being a couple. So I love writing. The Dick and Bab stuff, and I, I want that to be. I want I want that to continue to be a thread. You know what I mean? Like even if every story, like every single story, will not be a Dick and Bab story. Like this one obviously wasn't. But if Dick is in it and it takes place around this same time period, um, I want there to be something in there about them. You know, because uh, yeah, they they are uh, they are very close to my heart. Um, so yeah, and yeah, Radical Bacon. Who says fanfic has to be bad? I mean, nobody, right? Nobody. I've I've read some absolutely wonderful fanfic. You know, one of my literally one of my favorite Batman stories ever, 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 written by anybody, official, unofficial, um, is a fanfic story called Anniversary. That uh is is it's one of my favorite Batman stories ever. Um and I think I have it if you go to my fanfiction.net page, it uh it is, oh, it is, it is under my favorites. I have it, I have it chosen as one of my favorites. I didn't write it, but, uh, but someone really, really great wrote it. And, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, anyway, I think, uh, I think we can call this to a close. This has been a successful little fanfic read, I think. Um, I'll let you all move on with, uh, your evening and, and get started on your weekend. So I, I, I just want to say, as always, thank you all, um, so, so very much for indulging me and for listening to me read some fanfic for you. I, I, I appreciate it. I'm glad you liked it. Um, oh, Dana, am I ever going to write another verse like MCU? Maybe. I mean, I've written Star Trek fanfic. I don't see why I wouldn't write. I couldn't write Marvel stuff, too. I might I might have a decent Spider-Man story in me sometime. Like, I don't have, obviously, lots on my plate. You know what I mean? Like in terms of fanfic, like there's plenty, like the, the DCU stuff that we have planned is, is, you know, there's plenty of that. Uh, so, but if I get a, an idea for a Marvel story, like, yeah, I mean, I think I know a few of the characters in, in the Marvel universe uh, well enough to write them. So I, I might, maybe no plans right now. I, I plan on sticking with the DCU stuff for now, but yeah, sure. Maybe anyway. So yeah, as I was saying, thanks everybody for watching. Don't forget uh patreon.com slash Steve Shives. If you want to support my YouTube work in general, uh, don't forget uh, the, uh, the charity links in the description and, and all of that stuff. If you want to help out some of our friends who need a helping hand, uh, <laughs> radical bacon says Hamilton fanfic. <laughs> what else is there to tell? Like he's spoiler alert at the end of the show. He's fucking dead. Like, I guess I could do like, you know, kind of an interquel, you know, I just write like additional stuff from Hamilton's life that, uh, <laughs> that didn't make it into the show. And then I, I would have to write extra songs too, and then perform them as I read the story. But, oh, Dana, you do Hamilton, Angela, AU, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, Yep. There you go. That's what it would be. Um, anyway, so, um, thanks everybody once again for watching. I'm, 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 I'm releasing you into the wild once again. I'm really, really glad you enjoyed the story and, uh, I'll see you. I'll see you Monday for a new face palm five. And, uh, then next Friday for an ask away. And at some point, eventually in the hopefully not too distant future, I'll be back to, uh, to read you some more fanfic. So thanks a lot, everybody. Take care. <laughs>